and then let the people stroll in later. Um, so what I'll talk about uh, in the next 90 minutes is going to be sort of an em empirical perspective of market design. Um, so I'll be a little bit more, well, mechanism design, I should have said. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be switching between mechanism design and market design um, a little bit. Um, but hopefully, I'll, I'll try to be more general. So um, just to set ideas, uh, the, you know, the way I see uh, the goal of mechanism design is to come up with and improve institutions using economic theory. We have heard a lot about that uh, over the last week. Um, and the goal of the data, on the other hand, uh, could be twofold. One, it could motivate where we should move with our theory. So which directions we might specialize the models, perhaps, um, because you know, we know a lot about robust implementation in the universal type space. But again, maybe it's the, local, uh, it's the local implementation that we care about more in particular examples. Um, another, and this is sort of going to be the more uh, important feature from uh, my perspective today, uh, that's going to be we might be interested in reverse engineering sort of the primitives from the mechanism. Okay, so the basic idea is going to be we will know the environment or we'll assume we know the environment. We will know the mechanism and we'll try to ask, okay, with that knowledge, can we reverse engineer what the preferences must have been, uh, perhaps what the information structure must have been, and try to think about what can be improved in there. Okay. So in terms of, you know, given this audience is mostly interested in theory, um, I will be very brief in terms of econometrics and statistics. So most of, the, most, most of what I'll be f focusing on is going to be uh, the relationship between sort of data and, and, and these primitives um, and more pointing out directions uh, in which uh, I personally think that sort of more could be done from the theoretical, uh, from the theoretical side. So just to, set, just to set ideas, and this is going to be repetitive, I just want to sort of set up some notation that I'll come back to. So in terms of the you know, the, the way I'm going to think about the mechanism is, again, there's going to be an incomplete information world where agent is endowed with private information theta, which is drawn from some well-behaved uh, CDFF of theta. Um, and then we have some preferences given by some Bernoulli utility function over alternatives X, given the type theta I. And the mechanism is then going to specify uh, a you know, bunch of strategy sets and the function which takes the strategy sets and maps them into these alternatives. Okay, and so typically in mechanism design, you know, you, you try to think about how to come up with the gamma given the characteristics of that environment, like the information structure, and so on and so forth, and given some objective function. And that's sort of the key, maybe, distinction, as we have discussed earlier, between market design and mechanism design. Well, in market design, we might not have a clear objective function to maximize, for example, whereas in mechanism design, we are pretty uh, explicit about that. All right, in empirical work, we're going to do the inverse. So given the knowledge of gamma, like a second price auction, we're going to be interested in, and perhaps given some assumptions on characteristics of the environment, like we have a symmetric equilibrium and everybody knows the exact same things, and everybody draws their signal in an you know, IID uh, manner, we are going to have some data on repeated play of the exact same mechanism, and we might be then interested in recovering the F or the U. Okay? All right. So... This is sort of, this, this way of thinking about it allows us to formally kind of think about the identification problem. So in particular, given the data, is this function or potentially a correspondence uh, that takes the data and maps it into this F and U one, one to one uh, or not? So that sort of would be a formal statement of, of identification. I guess going this, you can map that back to Boyan's 80s something paper. Uh, you need to assume something about the behavior of the agents here. And yeah, yeah. So that's so that's also part of the that's part of the that's part of the so mechanism. Also, the solution concept used. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So current. So sort of this is where the literature has been over the I don't know thirty years maybe now since the new empirical I/O kind of. Uh, um, arrival and the current frontier is really weakening these things so that you know what can we say in terms of identification of these F's and U's perhaps um, if we don't want to impose as much on information structure or perhaps on equilibrium selection okay so we might have multiple equilibria we might not know 
which particular equilibrium is played in which part of the data, how do we actually, what can, is there something we can say? All right. So today I'll be focusing mostly on auctions. So that's sort of an easier case from my perspective because it's fairly easy to go back and forth between counterfactuals because we have an obvious metric to use. We're just gonna look at money, we have transfers. Tomorrow I'll talk more about education markets and there, of course, we don't have transfers, you know, for various reasons. Um, and then this is, gets much more complicated because, you know, again, the U is not gonna have a price in there. So transfer, you know, translating utils into something that we're going to be comp able to compare across counterfactuals is going to be much more complicated. Typically, we normalize something like a distance coefficient and we are, we are then going to be comparing uh, mechanisms in terms of miles traveled, whatever that might mean. Okay? But, so I'll talk more about it uh, tomorrow. All right, so let, let me jump right into what I want to talk about today. So I'll sort of set up the general approach, which you know, I'm going to call uh, a LaFont program, uh, just because uh, you know, I have it tied to what uh, Jean-Jacques was uh, teaching. Uh, then I'll illustrate it very quickly with single unit auctions, uh, just because you, you know, all of us are familiar with that environment and we have beautiful theory results uh, for that case. But I'll mostly focus on the multi-unit auctions, okay? So for probably more than half of the talk, just because again, theory is kind of, um, it, it, yeah, is, not unambiguous, I would say, okay? So there is a lot of possible possibility results uh, that don't allow us to rank things uh, in sort of a uh, general way. Um, and, so, and, and at the same time, there is a lot of interesting questions that pop out in these multi-unit auctions environments that, that uh, we don't necessarily see in single unit settings. All right, and so as I said, tomorrow we'll look at education markets. So this general approach, which, you know, again, I doubt uh, LaFont program is basically uh, the following. I've kind of hinted upon that when I was describing sort of the relationship between the theory and the data in terms of the mechanism design. So what we are going to do is we're going to use the knowledge of gamma to obtain what something like a, what I'll call an equilibrium characterization. So think about an, literally an equation which is going to link data and something that you care about, some unobservables, all right? Uh, so Jean-Jacques has been uh, doing it um, since late 80s, um, and basically that's where the new empirical I.O. Um, is even, uh, even these days, all right? And so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the data and this equilibrium characterization coming from the theory to get at these primitives that rationalize the choices. So we're gonna see bits, for example, and we're gonna ask what values that we care about could rationalize these observed bits given our knowledge of what the bidder's incentives should have been and say some particular equilibrium selection. Okay. Now, this, you know, it sounds all uh, kind of intuitive, but it turns out that this is actually in many settings not as easy as it sounds. So, if, for example, if you have multiple equilibria, how do you deal with that, all right? Um, now, so sometimes you might get point identification under a lot of assumptions you will. Uh, sometimes you because you might not be as, you know, you might not want to be as dogmatic in terms of what information structure looks like, you might get set identification. So I'll show you some examples uh, um, of that. Okay, so this would typically arrive, for example, if you only impose inequality constraints. This is going to show up tomorrow again in the education markets case much more. All right. Okay, and then the third step after we have done that, so now we have set of these, set of these uh, primitives that we care about or a point. Uh, in that set, and we want to use those to evaluate what else can we do. Switch an auction mechanism, put in the reserve price, uh, that sort of stuff. Test revenue equivalence. All right, so let me give you an example, okay? So first price sealed bid auction, IID types, private values, the easiest case, all right? The, our set of alternatives is I wins and I doesn't win. Now, this sounds like it's without loss of generality, but actually it already is something that you might worry about. So imagine, you know, imagine things like a merger contest or something like that, where, you know, a firm wants to acquire another firm. You actually might care differently who else acquires that firm, in which case this wouldn't be an exhaustive description. Okay. So assuming that part away, uh, so in other words, optimizing this, uh, normalizing this case of I doesn't win uh, to zero, uh, 
The necessary condition for optimal bidding is this fam famous uh, uh, expression, which basically says bit is the value minus a markup, where the markup is related to the distribution of bits. Okay? So well, all of you have probably seen that. Uh, but, and this is what I sort of want to uh, come across, the, uh, or, or bring across, this equation already embeds a lot of assumptions on the information structure. Okay? So, um, by the way, this relationship, this sort of a mo you know, nice monotone relationship is the crucial foundation for this famous paper by Gerberin and Wong, uh, which is on a non-parametric estimation on first price auctions. The basic idea here is to notice that, okay, bits I actually see, I, I see, so the total number of bidders, even though I will come back to that, it's not obvious. Uh, and then if you see B and you see I, well then, you know, you can put V on one side and everything else on the other side, and given you can estimate everything on the other side, you get your V. And once you have Vs for every B, you get your F of V. Okay? So that's the basic idea of the Kerperinian Wong approach. All right. But again, and I'm, I'll now, you know, I want to explicitly state what actually you have to assume to get that equation. And that is that you, only, you have to assume symmetric IIDKs in order to get that. Right? We know from asymmetric first price auctions, they would look very different. Uh, if, we didn't have, if we didn't have independent and identically distributed, well, if we didn't have independence, there would be some conditioning in this. And so the, the only reason why you get this beautiful expression is that, well, because the distribution of a first order statistic from n minus 1, or i minus 1, rather, in my notation, um, of uh, identically distributed random variables turns out to cancel out to this nice formula. Okay? Um, and as I said, the common knowledge of I is actually far from obvious. If you think about any kind of a setting, take eBay or whatever, okay, so even though eBay is not a first price, first price yield bid auction, who knows what these bidders know uh, and what they think, okay? And so even though in empirical work we do it over and over again, and in some settings this might be more reasonable than in others. For example, in treasury auctions that I'll talk about um, in a little bit, well, we know how many primary dealers there are, and we know they're forced to participate. So there it's somehow you know, a little bit less worrisome to impose the assumption that you know, the number of potential bidders equals the number of primary dealers. But in, a, in, a, in, in most of the other auctions, this is actually potentially problematic. So I'll, I'll have one slide addressing that because there is, there is possible uh, ways around that as well. Yeah? Is it possible in principle using data to distinguish, for instance, in an auction environment between the evaluation that an individual bidder has for a good and what he sort of believes in other evaluations of the other bidders? Or these so, you know, it all depends on the data. So, for example, uh, you know, I'll mention probably in a couple, well, a little bit later. So, there is a fairly exhaustive survey by Athey and Hale, which tells you what you can identify uh, in an auction environment. And in particular, if you, have, if you have bidders with asymmetrically distributed values, you know, there is a set, there is a particular type of data you would need to distinguish that. You know, you might guess that you would need to see bits with identities, something like that. Well, then it's fairly easy to, dis to sort of test whether these distributions are asymmetric or not. And then you could, I haven't seen any particular application of actually testing what your beliefs would be about sort of the rivals, but that would, I think, be fairly easy to extend to that environment. Okay, so now going back to our first price yield bid example. So this was, our, this was our equation, and now there's several ways to proceed, and, you know, I've set one of them. So given... We have assumed iid ness and so on and so forth. So what we can do is we can just plug, this is the Gerberin and Wong approach, we can just non-parametrically estimate the CDF. That's just, a, you know, that's just a histogram, and then the sum of the histogram is our capital G. Uh, G and we would be... Yeah, that's... Values. G is the distribution of bits. Bits? Yes. Yes. Okay. It turns out that there is a one-to-one -one mapping, and this is the one-to-one -one mapping, right? This equation gives you the one-to-one -one mapping to the distribution of values. Okay, you, you can just invert everything to V and you would get the distribution of yeah. that. Well, but that's the point. So you know G, right? Because you see the bits. That's your data. Yeah. Okay. So 
you know, if you have infinite amount of data, you know G, and then you are all done. That's sort of the get perignon walk. But there is another way you could do that, which is, okay, again, this is a first order this is a distribution of the first order statistic of I minus one random variables. So you could take your data of bits and sort of repeatedly resample I minus one bits from that data, record that value, do it a lot of times, and you will get the distribution of the first order statistic, right? That turns out that that's exactly what you would need uh, for the shading factor. Well, which one is better? Well, clearly this is going to sort of introduce a simulation error, so for efficiency reasons you would prefer that. But the reason why I wanted to sort of point this out, because we will come back to this in the multi-unit auction environment, in which case what we really care about is this marginal event that sort of that's the bit at which you can win. So it's the market clearing price, if you want, uh, that you care about. And so this is just another way how to get this distribution. Okay. So I'll come back to that. So I've mentioned Athey and Hale, you know, have this very exhaustive treatment of identification results um, in this world, um, basically covering all, uh, sub, you know, submodels in the Milgram and Weber's paper. So uh, to just point to one theorem, basically, if you have symmetric IPV models, so the classical simplest um, environment, you only need the transaction price, okay? And more importantly, the model is testable if you observe more than one bit or if you see variation in transaction prices as n varies. Okay? So then that tells you that the model is testable under these conditions. Therefore, what you ask would be subsumed in there. Okay? <coughs> so the key idea in these theorems, and there is a lot of theorems of this sort, the key idea is that you can think about basically in any of the single unit auction environment, uh, you can think about the transaction price in terms of some order statistic, right? So in an English auction, in a clock auction, I should say, which is important, in an English clock auction, the transaction price would be the second highest value, okay? In a, um, in a second price sealed bid auction, it would be second highest value, and so on and so forth. So if we have the distribution of the second highest value, we can just write down the expression for that in terms of the underlying parent distribution, now, this, is, this equation is again true only with IID assumption, only with independence and identically distributed random variables. So there's a lot of these informational assumptions that are buried in there, okay? But with those assumptions, once you, once you have this distribution of the order statistic, it's fairly easy to invert to the parent distribution, and that's the underlying idea of these identification theorems, okay? And again, the goal is you recover this F, and then you can think about, okay, if I were to, if I were to impose, you know, if I were to change the reserve price, how would the revenue change, and so on. Or with, the, with this F, I can ask, what's the optimal reserve price, um, and so on. All right, so there is a ton of applications, timber auctions, uh, eBay procurement, highway, school milk, a lot of them. And, you know, this is a literature that started in the 90s, um, and sort of has, is still being worked on. Uh, I don't personally find it particularly uh, exciting, but uh, uh, at least in these days, but nevertheless, people still work with timber. Um, okay, um, yeah, one thing I want to mention is that, well, it's not always the case that when you hear the word auction, you know, you can think about this sort of an identification argument. Just, you know, there's this crazy example I don't know if you heard about average price auctions. <laughs> so average price auctions are being used, I was surprised, uh, you know, in many places. Italy, some of, the, some of the small municipalities, so you wouldn't be surprised there, but even Japan, Switzerland, uh, and some Department of Transportation in Florida. So what an average price auction it does is basically it, it elicits bids. It's typically a procurement environment, and it elicits, bidders, it elicits bids from bidders and then basically awards the object to some function of the mean of the bits, okay? to, to whoever was closest to some function of the mean. Typically what they do is they, they, they trim it a little bit, they kill the lowest, they kill the highest, then take the arithmetic average, and whoever is closest to that gets, gets, to, make the, gets to make the bridge. Okay? You'll now, be surprised that some banks do that for interest rates. Banks do that sometimes. It's, it's a similar thing of averaging bids. I actually know that, yes. So LIBOR is constructed that way, and, and all, these, all these interest rates are... Exactly. <laughs> there you don't necessarily want to reveal the type. So I'm, I'm talking about, about the options on, on loans. Oh, really? Yeah, 
I would like to know that, actually. Yeah. Very good. So as you see, that this, this sort of a, well, a auction is really a bad <laughs> name because clearly this is going to end up being a lottery at the end of the day because any price can be an equilibrium. Uh, as you probably can see. So there is a big departure from any kind of a monotonicity relationship that you would have between bit and value. And that was the key, this monotonicity was the key that allowed us to do any kind of inversion of this sort. So in a first price sealed bit auction, it's this inversion. In a second price sealed bit auction, it would just be that. But sort of third price sealed bit auction, there would be an, a, you know, there would be an uh, upward factor and so on. Okay. So that's just an an, an anecdote. So by the way, the reason why they do that, even though again, you know, I think the reason is very different, but they say uh, that the reason is they want to make sure that people are not too aggressive, right? That they don't put in these very aggressive bits and they go bankrupt uh, because that creates all kinds of problems. But you might imagine as mechanism designers, there is many more efficient ways how to achieve that rather than awarding it by a lottery. Um, okay. So Theory is beautiful, um, but, and so here, the English auction is very different than the clock auction of the Milgram and Weber. So first thing you might worry about is, okay, if I see transaction prices, is this actually a second order statistic of the value distribution? Uh, in particular, I'll show you on the next slide, you know, a, a, a table from, uh, from a paper in which they fairly convincingly show that there is huge jump bidding uh, prevalent in English auction. So in particular, you might have an increment of a dollar, but you raise your bid by 50 or something like that. Okay? So if you have this jump bidding, you already can probably guess that the transaction price is not going to be the second highest value. It's going to be somehow related to that second highest value, perhaps by that bidding increment or perhaps by the jump bid, but it's not going to be quite that. So is that important? Is there a way around it? So I'll, I'll talk about that. And then the number of potential bidders is another thing. Th those are going to be two questions I'm going to address now in the single unit environment before we move to the second. Okay, so uh, to multi-unit. So the <coughs> the this is a table from Hale and Tamer's famous paper on timber auctions, uh, the favorite subject. Uh, and so what this shows is that, okay, so for different, different um, levels of the bids, there is different prescribed minimum bidding increments. So in, in, you know, in particular, as the prices go up, the increments go up. But the differences between the first and second recorded bids are big multiples of that bidding increment. So this is sort of telling you that the jump bidding is quite prevalent and is actually quite big. Okay? So now you might, uh, you might think, OK, let me ignore it. Let me assume that sort of it's a second order statistic. And let me recover the values. Okay? So you could do that. Sorry? the gap divided by the increment. So this is the difference between the last recorded bit and second to last recorded bit divided by the minimum increment. So there must have been a big jump bit between the second to last and last recorded bit. So if the gap is 2,000 and the increment is 110, how is the ratio 76? These are, uh, these are, this is a minimum increment. So the increment can only be bigger, which may, may make this a little, even less than 76. Yes, and it's not my table, so <laughs> but um, let me see. So or maybe you're this is this is an average tool. Probably doing that gap divided by increment in each instance, and you're exactly, and average you're averaging average over those instances. Exactly, that's, that's right. It's not the, the ratio of the average is not the average of the ratio. Correct. And that's probably it's why you get, but still, it's that would be my guess. It's a big difference. But again, that's not important for us, right? So what is important for us is this is different from one, yeah. and therefore we can't, we can't call it necessarily a second order statistic. Nevertheless, you know, and now this is a little bit more of a wishy-wishy argument given the discussion we just had. If we look at this number and compare it with this number, which I guess we shouldn't, but uh, um, it's much smaller, which sort of would say that if we are going to start thinking in terms of bounds, perhaps it's not that bad of an issue. I'll be more specific on the next slide. Okay? So in particular, rather, so look, we have a very easy auction. We know how this mechanism works. We know how we would do the inversion if we had this environment correspond to the usual um, clock auction. Instead, we, we just concluded that that would be a bad assumption. So what we're going to do instead now is going to depart a little bit the, you know, the gamma characterization. 
and think a little bit more broader. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to impose a couple of assumptions, which seem fairly reasonable, something like you know, rationality. Uh, so in particular, we are going to assume assumption one that ne nobody bits above their values. Okay? And assumption two, that if an auction is about to close, I don't have an incentive to bid an increment more. Okay, so delta is this minimum increment, and if this was my, so the, the second highest bit, or value for that matter, has to be at least delta below the winning bit, okay, or something like that. So what, with these two assumptions, we're going to come up with, well, it's going to be fairly easy for us to write down an equation which is going to bound the value distribution. So now I haven't imposed any equilibrium here, right? Whereas in the first price sealed bit auction, we impose the symmetric B and E. Uh, here we are just going to work with these two assumptions. Okay? So no equilibrium. We're going to assume still symmetric and, and prior values. Uh, and we're going to assume we, we, we see the transaction price. Okay? So what, what, what do we have from the transaction price? So by the way, so the transaction price is the first order statistic of the bits. Okay? Uh, so... <coughs> The first assumption tells us that the value must be above that. So the distribution of the highest value has to first order stochastically dominate the distribution of the highest bit. Okay? And the lower bound is sort of a similar argument you know, once we evaluate delta uh, at zero. Okay? So we get that the, high, the distribution of the highest bit that we see has to first order stochastically dominate the distribution of the second highest value. Okay? So with those, what remains for us to do in order to get at f of s? Well, we just evaluate these two guys, and we get a functional equation which is trivial to invert for any for any s. Okay, so for any this is what we see. If we invert this, we get the upper bound. If we invert that, we get the lower bound. Okay, so we get two different distribution of values, uh, and we can play with those. So now we haven't imposed any equilibrium, and we now have a set of values that are consistent with the bits that we see, and we can start asking what would be the optimal reserve price, for example, that's the type of the question that they are interested in, if, the value, if we know the values live in this, in this, in this region. Okay? And they actually show that this, this bound is reasonably tight, so that that question is you know, reasonable to answer. This is far from obvious. In many settings, you know, typically with site identification, you don't get that lucky, uh, but they did. Okay. All right, so it turns out that that paper has been generalized by Andres Argas Lopez, Amit Gandhi, and Dan Quint um, to ascending auctions without the IID assumption. But of course, that doesn't come for free. The extra assumption that they need is that they have the variation in the number of bidders across different auctions, but the basic argument is the same. They're going to construct some bounds. They're not going to be as easy now because they dropped the IID assumption, but they're going to construct some bounds, and those bounds are going to they, prove they're sharp and they're going to use them in these counterfactuals. They have to assume that, yeah. Or you have instrument that allows you to isolate the exogenous variation in the number of bidders. This is, again, that's a very good question because this is, again, not a, not a very satisfactory assumption, right? I mean, the fact that I see two auctions for two bridges, even though the bridges were the same, and one has 20 bidders participating and the other five, you would imagine there is some unobserved heterogeneity. There is something that makes these guys participate uh, in one bridge and not in the and not in the other. So <coughs> what typically these papers assume is the exogenous variation in N or existence of an instrument that allows you to isolate that. Okay, so I promised you the other, uh, um, the other source or the, or the other weakening of, the of these information assumptions that you need and that's the unknown number of potential bit I. So Unji Song has a paper which basically relies on a fairly uh, little known lemma in statistics, which basically says that, you know, if you take any absolutely continuous F, you can non permanently identify it if you know distribution of two order statistics, arbitrary order statistics, and the distance between them. Okay? So if you know fifth and third, you're fine. Basically, what you need is two order statistics and how far apart they are. Okay? If you have that, then sort of the intuition for that result, basically, is that if, the, if you have these distributions, it doesn't matter what i is, 
because these two distributions together identify a density of an order statistic of a sample size that comes from the higher minus one. Okay? So it's sort of like the smaller one cuts off the tail, then you have the bigger one, and there is uh, there you know the number of observations. So that's kind of, it's a conditional, it's a conditional distribution at that point in argument. So that paper never got published, but um, uh, the application was, and probably that's the reason, because the application was to eBay, because it's sort of the canonical one where I really is hard to know. Um, but there, it's very hard to argue that you actually see two order statistics. Even if you think that the winning bit is the second highest uh, value or uh, uh, something like that. It's very hard to think about, well, what's another order statistics I could get? So sh the argument she makes is that sort of the last bit before the winning bit should be somewhere close to the, uh, should be somewhere close to the third highest value and therefore I see a second and a third highest order statistic distribution and therefore I can do this. Uh -huh. Sorry, a stupid question. When you say K, K1 and K2, can I say K1 from the, one from the top or I have to say 17. You can say whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You just need to be able to tell me the difference between the two, because that's what we no, need. But then you have K2 minus 1. So you need to know K2 on the second part. So in what sense you have to know K2? I understand the K2 minus K1. That's good. But how about K2? <laughs> so maybe one of them you have to know the, yeah, well, then you would need, then you would know position of all of them, of both of them. Uh, yeah, good question. Let's assume that you good, let's assume that you know bo you know both uh, both numbers. Okay, I kind of remember you don't need that, but I I can't remember uh, I can't remember the argument. I'm starting to think maybe if this one has a k two maybe this one has a difference too, but. All right, so single unit auctions, again, theory is beautiful. We have the revenue equivalence theorem under fairly uh, well you know, understood assumptions uh, that are sometimes testable. But you know, as I'll hopefully argue, we have many more interesting applications in a more complicated mechanisms. And so that's where, uh, that's where, I'm, get, that's where I'm going. OK, so multi-unit auctions. So the basic idea is going to be the same. We're going to sort of come up with a Lafon program, so we're going to come up with an equilibrium condition that links data and the primitives, but we're going to change the questions quite a bit that we are interested in. So in particular, we don't have revenue equivalence anymore, uh, basically because we don't have uh, allocation equivalence. Um, you know, in single unit auctions, we have these sufficient, con sufficient conditions that guarantee efficiency, and that allows us to work with uh, you know, the, the representation lemmas and so on and so forth to get revenue equivalence. Uh, we don't have that in multi-unit environment in general, okay? So in particular, we have a lot of examples in which a particular mechanism can dominate another uh, based on efficiency or revenue grounds. You know, if, except for victory, efficiency can sort of go either way between the others, okay? Now, <coughs> so the three mechanisms that typically are considered, well, actually, typically, there's only two that are considered, the discriminatory and uniform price. Uh, for some reason, nobody cares about Vickery. This is one of those few cases that, uh, that, uh, that I, at least I'm not aware of any application uh, of a Vickery auction in multi-unit environment. Um, and so there is this eternal question of should we auction off, say, government debt using discriminatory or uniform price, a uniform price auction. And this is a question that has been out there since, like, you know, late 80s. And many people have worked on that. Um, <coughs> and so... The question then is how much could be gained, well, if anything, uh, if you were to switch, switch the mechanism. Um, and sort of a bigger overarching question is whether the mechanism really matters. Okay? So what I'll try to convey is that uh, maybe by the end of tomorrow is that my understanding of this, um, of this environment now is that the mechanism, particular payment scheme, you know, matters, but to a much lesser degree than other important <laughs> details, okay? So I'll talk more about uh, uh, those details. So example of questions that we might have and that we're going to touch upon in some of the application. By the way, today I'll talk about sort of three 
applications, uh, mostly because I understand them well. Uh, but so one is going to be U.S. Treasury. Uh, one is going to be trying to test the information structure uh, that we are going to impose, and we're going to use that to quantify also uh, customers' order value of customers' order flow. And last is going to be the liquidity provision. So this is going to be for those of us from Europe, how ECB allocates liquidity uh, between banks. So those are going to be the three main applications. But sort of the, the big questions that, um, that I'm going to try to get at is, well, in this environment, suppose, and it, independently of the payment rules now, uh, do bidders have market power that allows them to extract monopoly rents or, or information rents, if you want? Uh, uh, an important question there becomes, you know, what market structure would be optimal? This is a far from obvious. For example, in the U.S., you know, we have the primary dealer system. For a long time, it was only the primary dealers that were allowed to participate. Since late 90s, actually anybody can open an account with the Federal Reserve in New York and, and put in some collateral and participate. So now it has been opened up to participation. Uh, and then you have these customers. Well, I'll call them customers, but they are actually really big guys that prefer to go through primary dealers. So, you know, it sounds, you know, customer sounds like, a, you know, your mom and pop store uh, asking for a treasury bill. But if I tell you that BlackRock, who is the largest, you know, wealth manager in the world, prefers to, pop, you know, to, to, to push their orders through Goldman Sachs and, and other primary dealers, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, what's going on with this mechanism then, right? Because presumably they are not doing it for free. Uh, they're they are either, they might be willing to hide the size, they might be trading against some gains, they might be parting with part of the rents because they're going to get the gains somewhere else. There might be a lot of reasons, but, uh, which I'm not going to have time to talk about today. But certainly, these sort of details uh, become an important uh, component of you know, determining whether the mechanism is successful or not, rather than just the payment rule. Right. Yeah, all right. Yes. You can compare an auction where BlackRock going alone through, through going to a primary dealer? No, because you won't have the count. Well, okay. So this is a, this is a little bit more complicated question than that I can answer in like a minute. Okay. So under some assumptions, you could. So for example, the data certainly is going to identify separately BlackRock's bids. The data that the treasury has. Mm -hmm. The data that I don't see, but... I can get access to through somebody in the treasury. Uh, so you could potentially identify something like the distribution of values of BlackRock. But to conduct the counterfactual, that's going to be a difficult exercise. Because in this environment, and this is, I'm going to get there, but sort of this is an environment where constructing counterfactual equilibria, we don't know how to do. So basically what we have to do, and we are going to be comparing across mechanisms, we're going to be bounding stuff. Okay, we're going to be bounding stuff relative to, say, very conservatively, relative to some sort of a first best mm -hmm. situation, you know, complete information type of a setup. Okay, so, you can, you, so, so that you can sort of say, okay, how big of a loss of efficiency did we suffer? How big of a loss of information rents did we suffer? So now what you want me to do is basically take, suppose I got the primitives right, and change the mechanism so that BlackRock cannot go through a primary dealer, which is a very, very good question but I don't know how to construct the strategy of BlackRock in that counterfactual world. And I don't know how to bound it either. Maybe, th so that might actually, yeah, there might be some probably dirty ways how you could go around bounding it, but um, it's not, it's, it's far from obvious to me. Okay, so another question quite related to that, and that's one that we will be able to add, answer, is that you could ask, okay, given I told you now about this market structure that BlackRock has to go through primary dealers, you can ask, well, how much do the primary dealers actually benefit from that? Okay, so we're not going to be able to do that in the U.S. yet, even though hopefully at some point we will, uh, but I will have a Canadian data set that is going to allow me to answer this. Um, we're going to have... <coughs> you might be interested in, and this is something which we will not do today, but say if information acquisition is important, so you have something like an IPO auction, uh, and you want to encourage you know, the underwriters to collect and publish information about the uh, 
the firm, well, then that might be a very important uh, component of how to design the mechanism and, and so on. Okay? Yeah, so one detail that I actually want to point out, because I don't think I'll come back to that, is in Europe, you know, so not in the US and not in Germany, but in, in uh, most other countries, what happens when the government sells government debt um, is that auctions occasionally, sometimes more frequently, uh, become undersubscribed. So basically you want to sell a certain amount and nobody wants to buy it. Uh, now this is typically a problem. So you might have read an article about a year ago about Spain running into this. Uh, and so then sort of yields in the secondary market skyrocket and so on and so forth because people start worrying about rollover risk default. Uh, um, so how to deal with these sort of situations is a much more of a first order <laughs> component of the mechanism than the payment rule. So that's sort of, that's an example of, of, uh, that, uh, of these details that I've mentioned before. Another, which, um, which I'll come back to in the last application, you might think about um, you know, things like uh, systemic risk uh, being encouraged or discouraged by particular mechanisms. Uh, now, as a theorist, you might say, okay, you, know, you just give me the list that you care about, I'll write down the objective function, and I'll tell you what the optimal mechanism is. And there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. The question is, what are these things? You know, come, up with, come up with those things and put the right weights on them. That's sort of where the rabbit comes uh, into the hat. Okay, well, another example is sort of, say, Google, when they were doing their IPOs, what they really cared about was not revenue maximization, at least so they say, uh, but rather distributing the stock so into, you know, as wide um, ownership um, as possible. So again, th these type of objectives are typically something which we don't consider on the theoretical side. Why do they want wide distribution? I asked Larry and Sergey. Uh, <laughs> they just, I guess they knew they were rich enough and they wanted to sort of. I think you have a vested interest in Google. No, but it goes against the, the old idea that. Of governance. Held, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but remember that they have two different class. They have different classes of stocks, so they kept all control. So what they distributed among people had no impact on voting, basically. Let me skip the literature. So the <coughs> so let me now start to talk about how we can use this auction data uh, in the multi-unit environment. Okay. So again, the world we're in is that bidders bid for multiple units. We are selling 1,000 treasury bills. Um, you can express now a demand, or a bid curve, rather, uh, for the 1,000 treasury bills. Uh, and it turns out it's easier in this environment to think about it in terms of a share auction. So, so Bob Wilson has a seminal paper in late, uh, in late 70s. Um, so we can think about bidders actually submitting a function as their bid is now going to be a function mapping a quantity into the price. So for any quantity, it specifies how much they're willing to, uh, well, it specifies their bit. Okay. So typically in practice, and this is again a little bit of a divergence between theory and the data, uh, in practice, some of it is for historical reasons probably, but these mechanisms impose quite severe restrictions. So as I said, Wilson is a nice model, everything is smooth and differentiable, and you, know, you use a function B of Q as your bit. In practice, you actually can only use up to 10 BQ pairs to characterize this function. In some settings, actually, it's four. In some settings, it's unbounded. But the general uh, message from how these auctions work is actually that nobody uses more than you know, four or five. Okay? So that's kind of a puzzle because you know, how, can you do, how can you do worse uh, or rather by submitting more, more bits? In, okay, so maybe, for sure you can do weekly better, that's a fairly easy uh, argument. In fact, it's a fairly easy argument to show that you can do strictly better uh, for any non-degenerate uncertainty that you are facing. Okay? And in that case, how do we rationalize this? Okay, typically, uh, th th I like this argument that comes again from Bob Wilson has the book on price discrimination that you might have seen at some point, uh, in which, 
he has a very, well, and he has a paper with Chow on electricity. Uh, but basically, he has a very nice argument which can be adapted to this environment that shows that the gains from an additional approximation of that continuous function decline at a quadratic rate. Okay? So to just give you an idea, so this comes all from numerical uh, or from approximations um, of smooth functions, something that computer scientists know many, much more uh, than I do. But, but um, the, the base, to, to give you a, a, an idea of the scale, this basically says something like if, if you were to submit a one-step step function and you were to get 50% of the available surplus by doing that, okay, three would get you 95% in. Okay, and five would get you like 98 or something. So, so basically this tells you that you really need just a few to get very close to your optimal surplus. And then if any kind of a notion of you know, complexity or whatever you want, uh, you bring in, in the model, you can rationalize this bidding behavior fairly easily. So the way I did it in one paper is I just put in some you know, cost of bidding, basically cost per, cost, per, cost per K. All right, so this is how your data is gonna typically look. Uh, now, the downside of this is that, well, it turns out that, okay, this theorem tells us that in payoff space, the strategies in the Wilson and this discrete game are gonna come very close. But in the strategy space, which is what we care about when we're gonna be inverting stuff, this may not be true, okay? So in particular, the fact that the mechanism restricts bidders in a particular way needs to be, this needs to be taken into account when we construct the inversion, this equilibrium condition I mentioned earlier. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do now. Oh, okay, maybe next slide. So <coughs> just to come back, the typical the data set is gonna have a bunch of auctions. Uh, we're gonna assume here, okay, I switch to N, should be I. Uh, we're gonna assume that we have, we observe the number of bidders. Um, we have the total supply Q, again, the thousand treasury bills, for example. Um, and then these, these bits, okay? Sometimes we might have other covariates. Let's assume that away for the purposes, for the purposes of this talk. And what we want to do is, again, the Slafon program. So how do we do that? So, again, a big, just now a broader overview. I'll come to the exact equations on the next, on the next slide. But, again, independently of the payment rule, you can always think about the auction as the bid being the willingness to pay minus the shading factor, okay? The shading factor in that single unit environment was related to the beliefs about rival section. It was about where this market clearing price is gonna be. How, how high do I have to bid to get to that event of winning with my value? <coughs> it turns out that there is a good intuition for this shading factor as you will see uh, on, on, on uh, when we characterize the uniform price auction, that gets to do with the demand elasticity, okay? So basically, the more inelastic is the supply, in this case, because I'm getting the good, well, the more I'm gonna shade, and so on and so forth. So it's a, this is, there is a nice intuition uh, linking the price theory with, uh, with the auction theory. In this, in this equation? Not so even uniform price auction you can think about in, in this way. Basically... Well, it's not true for a auction. Well, the shading factor could be zero. Or it could be negative that you use... A third price auction. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. I didn't, Im I didn't say what it is. I just said that there is a strategic component, basically. That's all I want to say. Okay? This is certainly, this is certainly without loss of generality, this is a strategic component that is the difference between the two. Okay, so the model, just a little bit more formally. So we have these I bidders, each of them is endowed with some willingness to pay. Now it's gonna be a function in this <laughs> multi-unit environment. So we, I'm gonna keep theta as being the, the type for, unlike in the single unit auction, we don't need to impose this to be one dimensional. I don't care, this can be multi-dimensional. Uh, and it's gonna have some nice distribution. For, for, for the time being, let's do IID. We can relax that later, okay? Now, you can see I buried one important, one important piece in there. Uh, well, I didn't because I didn't put an index, but if this was theta i, which is what I had in mind, uh, I imposed private values right here, okay? And so I'm gonna come back to that again. But, so the basic 
everybody sees what I mean? So basically, if we had interdependent values, as, as, as Stephen did in the previous talk, we would have theta i and theta minus i. Okay? Right now, I want to start with the, with the private value case. Okay? So this is the, we have some distribution of private information. Private information shifts around this willingness to pay functions, and this is what we care about. Okay? Now, Q, again, that's sort of the supply. It turns out that that can be random, because many times, the, say central banks decide at the very last minute they announce they want to, they want to sell 1,000 treasury bills, but that they, they actually sell 1,200 or something. Okay, so this can be random. We're going to assume that that bidders have rational expectations with respect to that, so they know what the distribution of the queue is. All right. So how the auction works? We are looking at a uniform price auction. The auctioneer is going to look for the market clearing price, which is going to be the highest price at which demand weekly exceeds. Well, Q, okay, uh, in the share auction, Q is normalized to one. <coughs> there might be rationing necessary, so if there's excess supply at this market, uh, excess demand at this price PC, we're going to proportionally ration the bidders um, at that price. Um, and then, that's the definition of the uniform price auction, bidders pay PC for all units they get, okay? Now note, and you know, this is sort of going to foreshadow a little bit where we're going, this PC, from the perspective of the bidder in the interim stage, is a random variable, right? Because it's a function of private information of everybody and realization of Q and the equilibrium strategies. Okay? So, <coughs> so that's random. So when the bidder is solving his optimization problem, he comes up with beliefs about this PC, the distribution of this PC, and and solves that problem. So how does that look? So this is a necessary condition. So this is what I've called EC before. So this is the equilibrium condition that is going to allow me to link bidders, bits and values. But again, so if we were to use data from, say, multiple auctions, an implicit assumption we would be making is that they're playing the exact same equilibrium. Okay? If we are were to use data from one auction, well, we would be assuming that everybody's playing the same equilibrium given the estimation strategy I'm going to talk about. So, back to the equilibrium condition. So, what the equilibrium condition basically says is that, well, you know, you can think about what a price taker would do, okay? A price taker would bid in a way that he would expect his marginal willingness to pay to be exactly equal to the expected price, conditional on that price, on, on conditional on him winning, which means that the price has to be actually less than what he is bidding. So there is a little bit, it, there's a little bit of uh, nasty notation because of these step functions that have to be, you know, used to characterize the, to characterize the shading factor. But there is a very easy interpretation of this once you go to the price theory, because once you think about an oligopolist who faces an uncertain demand, which basically this is an oligopsonist facing an uncertain supply. Uh, what is he going to do? Well, he would, you know, normally oligopolist would just say price equals to marginal cost minus Q times P prime. So it's some function of the demand elasticity. It's just a learner, learner rule. If we don't know what the demand will be, or supply for that matter, we just put expectations in front of it. Okay? And you, get, you see that you get something very similar to that. All right? So the uniform price auction is very similar to an oligopoly. Is, we know that from Klemper and Meyer kind of. And this is just a nice a link between the two. Okay? Important, com com important thing, this is just a single agent necessary condition. You don't need an equilibrium for this condition to hold. What we when we will impose an equilibrium is when we start estimating this guy. So again, going back to our first price auctions, what we needed, is we, int we were interested in that. B was data. And so we needed to get the handle on that G of B divided by I minus 1 divided by lit, uh, times little g. So that shading factor. Here, this is a little bit more complicated because this is not just B. This is a statement about where B appears in that conditioning event. Uh, but as you see, both of those sides are a function of this PC, or the distribution of the PC, rather. Okay? So we need to get that distribution of the PC, and then we are basically done. Because this is, a, this is a function of that, this is data, this is a function of that, and that's a function of that. Right? So if we have the distribution of PC, we're back in that sort of world that I've, I've discussed 
uh, I've discussed before. Now, and I'll show you how to, how to, how to, how to do that. Um, there is a lot of applications of this. So US now, of course, is running uniform price auction uh, uh, after Friedman has been arguing for it for a long time and the US switched in, in mid 90s. Uh, uh, turns out Korea runs a uniform price auction, Czech Republic too. It, for some reason, the prev you know, most of the countries still run discriminatory, just as a fact that uh, you might know. Okay, given I'm going to need some, some statement about the equilibrium for the estimation part, uh, th there it, it might be actually worthwhile to think about does an equilibrium exist in this environment at all? And it turns out we don't know. So for finite k, so with these restricted strategy sets, okay, it's, it's hard to state to get the existence proofs just because you cannot get rid of the ties, which normally you can get rid of by sort of these profitable deviations. Okay? It turns out that without restrictions on k, well, we know more about existence. We know existence of an equilibrium and a strictly increasing strategies from David McAdams' work. Okay, so discriminatory auction. Um, so just in terms of where I'm, where I'm going, I, I want to now present sort of the, the, the characterization, the EC condition for the discriminatory auction as well. And then I, I'll show you that actually it depends also just on the distribution of the market clearing price. And once you have those two results, then we're going to talk about how to get that distribution of the market clearing price, and then we go to the applications. Okay? So that's the roadmap. Because the applications are going to sort of be uniform price auctions, discriminatory auctions. They're going to be back and forth. So I don't want to... Uh, okay, so the discriminatory auction, again, with these restricted strategy sets. Um, oh, one comment, one last comment uh, relative, with respect to the uniform price auction. If you were to get this characterization equation from the Wilson's model, okay, you would get something very different. And in particular, uh, once you would start evaluating it on the data, you would get exactly what I've talked about before, that in the strategy space, the optimal strategy or the observed strategy in the auction with restricted strategy sets is going to be very, very far from what uh, uh, the Wilson model would, uh, would say. Uh, very far. If K was large, it's not going to be very far. With K is 3, it's going to be very far. Okay, discriminatory auction. Equilibrium condition, again, is just a statement, you know, bit is going to be value minus a shading factor. Now, this is a much easier shading factor to explain because, you know, you take this to the denominator, you take the limit, sort of, as you go to this continuous B of Q, uh, and you get something like this, which is exactly what our condition was in, this, in the first price auction uh, anyway, right? So in the first price auction, it was the first order statistic of other people's bits uh, divided by the density. It was this, this hazard uh, um, ratio. So here, it, it, the trade-off is exactly the same. You're thinking about a trade-off only on that marginal unit, really. That's sort of what gets you, gets you there. But the bottom line is that, as you see, again, this is data, this is data, and this is a function of the distribution of PC. So again, if we have the distribution of PC, we get back our, OK, I'm missing a theta here. We get back our Vs, and we can do all kinds of interesting, potentially interesting uh, exercises with those primitives. So, Discriminatory auction, as I said, are much more prevalent. And, you know, the ECB has been running them uh, until Lehman. And I'll show, you, I'll show you why only until Lehman. But that's actually a very good sort of mechanism design question uh, of how they can switch back. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll talk about that. Turkey, most countries that you would think uh, actually are running this. The, the, the nice thing, the one nice thing about, let's say, discriminatory auction is that at least we know an equilibrium and distributional strategies exist because, because ties are not an issue there. Okay, so the estimation of this PC. So this is the only econometric part uh, that I'll mention. Um, so this is based on Ali Ortaxu's uh, job market paper uh, from 2002. And so the basic idea in this IID case is very simple. Okay, and this can be generalized quite a bit. Remember that I said that this capital G of B in the first price auction can be also estimated by sort of looking at the distribution of, sorry, the distribution of the first order statistic of bits could be estimated by always drawing I minus I, I minus one bits with replacement and recording the highest one. 
Well, we are going to do the exact same thing. Because what we're going to be doing here is we're going to take the vector of bits, okay, that the, our data, and we're going to be always drawing with replacement i minus 1 bits from that. So what are you doing? You're sort of, imagine you have a lot of data, okay, infinite amount of data. What that means is that each of those thetas appears exactly in proportion to the population probability that it occurs, okay? Which means that you have as many strategies observed, submitted by the theta, as you would have if you were to draw ex ante from that F distribution. So now, in a finite sample, this is just an approximation of this idea. But basically, by drawing a uh, I minus one bit, you are simulating a state of the world. You are simulating a realization of a vector of theta. Okay? If you do that, well, once you draw them, you can just basically subtract them from the supply and you're going to get the residual supply that the given bidder is facing. If you intersect the observed bit with this simulated residual supply, you get a market clearing price. And now you do it a bunch of times, you get the whole distribution of market clearing prices and, and that's what we need. Okay? So it's exactly like that simulation of that first sort of statistic in the first price, first price steel bid auction. Let me show you a graph. This is what it looks like. Okay? So the, or the, the picture. This is the a bidder's bid, okay? And these are the different simulated market clearing prices. Intersections are, uh, sorry, residual supplies. Intersections are the market clearing prices. You get the distribution. And this is all we needed to, evolve, to get the V. So independently of the payment rule now, right? So in the discriminatory or uniform price auction, in either way, there would be a mapping from this and the bid to the V. So what's the axis? This is price. So this is, the, this is a histogram of market clearing prices that you get by recording all these intersections. So this is a residual supply intersected with a bit. Intersection is one realization. I record the data set of these market clearing prices, and this is the distribution of that. Okay? Now, now you see that I've buried a lot of information assumptions in there. So the IIDness was important, right? So the independence allowed me to do this resampling without any other conditioning. The identical part allowed me to not condition on identity, okay? Um, um, sometimes this might be okay, sometimes you might be worried. So for example, uh, this identical part, you can totally get away with, right? So you might imagine, okay, Chase might have very different bid than Bank of America, well, that just means if I have, if I, if I don't worry about unobserved heterogeneity, I might record bits over a year, okay? And I might just index bits by Chase, index bits by Bank of America, and I would just do the resampling where I would insist on having one draw from Chase, one draw from Bank of America, and so on and so forth. So you, there's nothing wrong with making this finer in any way you want, but this, you know, even as a theorist, you probably see that there is a problem with, okay, if I'm going to compare... January 1st with December 1st, uh, they're probably not apples and apples. Okay? Um, very good. So now we know how to get. Yes? No, no, no. You, this, is what, this is what this is doing for you. So you have the realization of the supply. That's a vertical line. That's our 1,000 treasury bills. By drawing I minus 1 bits, that means that I have now drawn I minus one strategies that I have observed. I subtract them from the vertical line. And that's what's left for this bit that I'm thinking about. So this is what's left at a given price for this bidder. And now I'm looking at the bit that he actually submitted and see what price would have had, would have had occurred in that state of the world. Okay, so now why are we doing that? So, okay, so, you know, hopefully now you're convinced we have these willingness to pay. So we have these Vs. So what we can do with that? We can do a few things. We can calculate surpluses. So exposed, we can now ask, okay, we know what you paid. We know what your value is. We know what your surplus is. We can calculate interim surpluses. We, know, we have the distribution of market clearing prices. So we can sort of integrate out. And we can get sort of, okay, we know the exposed for the realization of the of the thetas, but now we can go back and ask, okay, 
if I were to integrate over theta minus i, what would have I, would, would have I gotten? Integrating over theta minus i is the same thing as integrating over pc in this case. I guess theta minus i cross q. <coughs> All right. An important, okay, one thing I've kind of mentioned, but I want, again, I want to stress it. The assumption of the information structure is completely crucial uh, on est for estimating this, this distribution of the market thing price. Okay? If I didn't have independence, if I thought, because, by the way, what this is doing is really imposing rational expectations on top of everything. It's basically saying every bidder thinks that everybody is symmetric and is submitting these bids that I have in my data. Okay. All right. So applications in the last 20 minutes. Um, the first one, so treasury auction data. So again, you might be interested in, okay, well, one, I, I, I actually have to mention one number because I think it's kind of impressive. Le everybody laughs about I.O. because, you know, we study the toilet paper and toothpaste <laughs> and, and, you know, morning cereal and so on. So these markets which are worth maybe a billion <laughs> if, you, if you are lucky. Uh, so the U.S. debt instruments transact on the order of 560 billion a day. Okay, so it's a really, a really big and important market. It's bigger than global equity, by the way. Okay. Anyway, that's uh, just so that you don't laugh about I.O. Uh, <laughs> so here, what we're going to do is we're going to have detailed bidding data um, from the U.S. Treasury. Well, we don't have it, but the co-author works, works there, so he was the one who, who ran the code. Um, and we have data on three categories of bidders, primary dealers, direct bidders, and indirect bidders. Okay? Turns out primary dealers purchase about two-thirds, direct bidders about you know, something between one-tenth and one-fifth, and indirect bidders the rest. As I said, so indirect bidders, those are the customers, so those are the guys that the, tre the treasury actually deems important enough that they want their bids separately designated, but their bids get revealed to primary dealers. Okay? So there is some information leakage somewhere. And they're doing it voluntarily because all of them could participate uh, as direct bidders. Okay. You're there are some other bidders that we never find out. Yeah. So if you were to sub, if you were to go to Goldman and say, "I want a treasury bill," I wouldn't see you in my data. I would see a big bid by Goldman who aggregates all Stevens and all you know Eric's and so on. But these, so what I call indirect bidders are really important, like big guys. So like, you know, pension funds, teachers pension funds, and, and you know, uh, I mentioned BlackRock and th that sort of stuff. Uh, and until late 90s, China and Japan also had to route their bids through primary dealers, which was one of the reasons why the Treasury then went to this direct bidding, uh, or why they allowed this direct bidding, so that Japanese and Chinese uh, don't complain that their bits are being used and front run, something that we're going to talk <coughs> about by, uh, by the primary dealers. Okay. Turns out f for sort of the market is actually not very concentrated. I don't know how much HHI uh, sort of tells you, but believe me that numbers like 500 is very, very, is very, very nice. Okay, so what can we do? So of course the treasury is interested in, okay, should we switch to discriminatory auction? What's going to happen? Yeah, that would be like the first question that they ask. Well, I told you I don't know how to compute the equilibrium, so I have a willingness to pay uh, distribution, but I don't know how to compute the equilibrium, so what can I do? Uh, well, I can for sure start by asking how much did the mechanism fail to extract? So in particular, I can compute these ex-post ex surpluses and add them up. If you do that, that's sort of one source of inefficiency or rather from the, from the auctioneer's perspective, inefficiency, uh, um, that the discriminator auction could improve upon, possibly. It turns out that this is about two basis points. Okay, again, this is a small number, but a small number of a large number can be a large number. Uh, but whatever, at least we can tell the treasury, the politicians kind of, this is what you know, the upper bound is. This is not the only uncertain, this is not the only inefficiency, the other is of course coming from misallocation. So because of the uniform price auction incentives to shade the demand and, and ask for less at a given price because you think you are pivotal and you can impact the market getting price, there's going to be some misallocation. How much inefficiency comes from that? About the same order. Okay? So these two numbers provide you with a conservative upper bound on how any change in mechanism, uh, even the optimal mechanism, wouldn't be able to get you more than that. 
So this then leaves it in the hands of the politicians to say, okay, is this something worth risking, you know, participation issues and so on. Okay, so this is sort of what you can do without going to, uh, this is a very simple exercise without, we have everything to do this at this point. We don't have to, we don't have to do anything more. By the way, again, but remember, we have imposed a lot of these informational assumptions when we were getting the distribution of the market gain price. Um, okay. Yeah, one comment that is worth mentioning, given I don't know how much you guys follow the U.S. Treasury, but there is a lot of discussion about potential collusion. Uh, so <coughs> one thing worth mentioning is that this estimation method actually would be consistent even in presence of a collusion where the cartel would be all inclusive. But yeah, I don't, I'm not going to go into, I'm happy to talk about it uh, later. So let, let, me, let me actually skip the market structure. Uh, so there is some shading, but shading isn't bad. That shouldn't be that surprising given these fairly small numbers. That kind of is, is, uh, is, um, follows from that. Um, and it turns out that the primary dealers shade the most, of course, because they have the most market power. They, they, they submit the biggest demands, therefore, they have the biggest impact on the price, therefore, they're going to be shading, shading the more. Now, an important assumption I buried in there, and even though I mentioned it, is that I'm going to think about treasury bills as being a, a private value uh, object. And, you know, if you ask economists uh, what they think is a good example of a common value, Object typically a treasury bill is going to be first thing that they say uh, for un a reason unknown to me. I think it's a completely bad <laughs> answer, but uh, but people say that. Why is it a bad I'll I'll get to that. I'll get to that. That's sort of the uh, that's that's the that's the point. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is a typical question. So how would you how could you? Okay, a related question. So I'm going to address both of them at once is that, you know, do the primary dealers actually, how much do they earn from observing these indirect bidders, indirect bidders demands? Okay, so those two questions I'm going to try to address at the same time. And the way I'm going to go about it is, um, and, then, and then I'll give some intuition for the private value so that I satisfy uh, that question. But sort of the, the um, ideally what you would want to have is something like, you would want to see the primary dealer submitting their bid, okay? Then you would want to see BlackRock coming in, telling him what they want. And then you would want to see primary dealer react to that. So all of this would happen before the auction. That would be great, right? Because then if everything happens sort of very, very over a very short time interval, you could describe the difference, ascribe the difference between the bits by the primary dealer to that information contained in the BlackRock's bit. And therefore, under private values, let's say, okay, the difference in the payoffs to the primary dealer before the information arrived and after the information arrived would be approximately the value of information, which is going to be a calculation we're going to make. Having said that, that calculation is going to be only valid for private values, of course, because if the values were interdependent, the primary dealer would invert the bid and figure out, update somehow, what the value of the common component or the interdependent utility would be. So the, 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 the second updated bit would be a composition of the two, okay? Some notion of, okay, now I know better what the competition will be because I've seen BlackRock's bit, I don't have to integrate over it. Uh, and uh, I uh, now have a better value, a better idea about the, about the uh, um, value of the item. One thing I forgot to mention, when I talked about the sim resampling approach to estimating this distribution of market gain price, um, another way how to think about that, so rather than drawing I minus one uh, bits with replacement, you can, think about this in you can think about that as integrating out the uncertainty over all these other guys. It's the equivalent, it's the equivalent statement. Okay. So it turns out the Canadian Treasury auction have that structure that I've mentioned. So in particular, what you see is you see a primary dealer submitting the solid line, okay? Then you see a customer coming in with some sort of a crap little bit, and then you see the primary dealer submitting another, okay? So now, well, this is, this is great because if we had private values, we know the value of information from the calculation of this sort, okay? We invert this in the same way we did before. We get the values, we compute the surpluses, we take the difference between surpluses, we're done. Now, 
what can we what can we do though about the primary uh, about the uh, common value case? Well, notice that some of these bits are going to be for the same quantity. So now, what we can do is we can ask, okay, let me do the inversion of the first bit where I was integrating out over this customer. And now let me do the inversion for this updated bit where I know what this bit is. So in particular, when I'm simulating the distribution of market going price, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Q, I'm going to subtract this realization, and I'm then I'm going to resample I minus 2, sort of. Okay? That's the idea. So now, if you do the inversion in the two ways, under private values, you better get the same V. Agree? There is no updating of values under private values. So you should get the same V. And that sounds like a, this can be formalized and you can do a statistical test of this sort. Okay? So this is what we, and I'm going to get to the intuition why <laughs> the test actually fails to reject private values. So just bear with me anyway. But, uh, uh, but this is exactly what, you know, we have done in one paper in using this Canadian data. So this is sort of what it then looks like. You're sort of comparing whenever the square and the circle appear on the same queue, you're asking, are they indistinguishable in, in statistical sense? Okay, it turns out that, you know, the test fails to reject, even though there is some qualitatively, uh, you know, there is some qualitative directional differences. So like three months, you fairly, you, you fairly uh, convincingly reject, but with 12 months, you know, it, the rejection is not as strong, you know, whatever, in statistical sense. Uh, uh, and so now to give you some intuition for why I think treasury bills are actually more reasonably modeled as private value, uh, objects and again if there is one thing that I always like to tell students to take away from any auction lecture <laughs> like if this is this is this is it so basically if there is an information that's publicly available to everybody okay at the time of the auction it's only the residual that matters and so for these particular private so the fact if I were to auction a dollar bill it's not a common value auction okay that's another example of that sort it would be your private value for having my dollar in your pocket. Because everybody agrees it's worth a dollar, right? And so with the treasury bill, it's similar because there is a when issued market. And on top of that, there is basically instruments that have exact same maturity by the time this auction is run. So all these pin down sort of the common value component pretty, uh, pretty closely, I would say. So I don't want to say that there is no, but I would say it's certainly second order there relative to you know how I think I can manipulate you know how can how, how, how I can gain uh, in terms of uh, uh, outstanding short orders that I have and so on okay so that would be that would be my explanation so the when issued market for those of you who don't know what it is it's a forward market that starts about a week before the auction so basically the treasury bill gets traded actively before the auction itself so whatever arbitrage you could be making, you could have done before the auction itself. <coughs> All right. And so given, again, so assuming now the null of private values so that we are in the world that we were describing, we can get these we can get these values before and after information arrives and average across all these events. And we get back that approximately one third of the of the rents actually comes from from this information, uh, from this, uh, from this extra information that the primary dealers have. Okay. Now, this, in a, you know, in relative sense, this is actually a big number. Okay, a third is a lot, but these auctions are actually reasonably competitive. Same as in the U.S. Okay, so the the the, the surpluses are kind of smaller than the U.S., but not not by much. I should have said the U.S. Uh, example I've talked about before. The averages mask somewhat the heterogeneity because the surplus is on very short instruments and very liquid instruments like a three month or one month treasury bill are very, very tiny. Not surprisingly, because there is a lot of competition. So basically, if you were to look at an auction of a one month treasury bill, 30 day, you know, you would have a supply of, say, a thousand, but demand for 20,000. OK, so if you have an auction like that, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that sort of there's going to be very little left uh, to the bidders, because basically the, the, the probability that you're going to be pivotal and move the price is tiny and therefore you have no incentives to shade in that in that uniform price auction 
surplus, but the average, the expected surplus being so small? No, but this is a this is a statement that this the fraction this is a fraction of that that's ascribable to that information arriving. So this is the total oh. surplus that they get. Out of that, oh, about a third comes from them observing that information about competition. Okay, so la what I want to finish today with is this uh, uh, is this liquidity uh, provision problem, which. I think should be quite actually interesting from the theory uh, side. And so in particular, what the central bank, in, in this case ECB, is interested in is providing liquidity to the banking system. Um, and sort of historically, for various reasons, they wanted to do it by an auction because they wanted to give the banks uh, a way how to express their willingness to pay for it. Okay? So they wanted them to differentiate themselves and, and hopefully uh, hopefully express their uh, willingness to pay. Why now, why did they want to do that? I, well, I don't know. So this is, so they are kind of secret. So this is a, that's a very good question, which I asked them. <laughs> and, and they are kind of secretive about their objective function. This is one of those problems that you always face when you deal with treasury and central bank. They never tell you what they optimize. Okay. You can tell them that you, you, you think what they're doing uh, doesn't make sense. And they tell you, well, if you knew our objective function, you know, <laughs> Anyway, but so, yeah, that's a, that, I think that's all right. Maybe they don't know, and they just want to mask it. The secrecy kind of supposed, is supposed to mask that they don't know. Um, for, and uh, you know, a related question, by the way, which uh, you know, I, I, I'm working on kind of now, is, is as the US Treasury, for example, auctions off simultaneously many different maturities, okay? One year, 10 year, and so on and so forth. How they split a given, amount that they want to raise between these maturities? That's a really good question. Uh, uh, and you know, how you would want to do that as if your objective is somehow smoothing um, rollover risk or whatever, all these uh, maybe incentivizing liquidity provision in the secondary market in these different instruments. All those things should be coming into that objective, but the way they're solving it is some spreadsheet, uh, which doesn't, of course, have this at all. It's sort of like some, okay, I auctioned off a thousand uh, months ago, so I'm going to do 900 today. So the, the, the theoretical reason why central banks want to provide liquidity is to prevent uh, solvency, liquidity issues. Well, well to, pre to, to prevent a, to, to minimize systemic risk. Exactly. You don't care about one bank failing, but you don't want to chain reaction. But Willingness to pay might, might be that's exactly where I'm going. Oh. Where, where I'm going. Oh, okay. So that's going to be my last slide, kind of. That exactly that's what you should be thinking about. Right. So on the one hand, they talk about systemic risk. Okay. On the other hand, they allow either and they allow auctions with crazy bits, crazy high bits, which of course come from banks that you probably shouldn't be shouldn't be saving. So anyway, so I guess from the mechanism design perspective, that's a great question. So whom you should, uh, maybe the bits shouldn't be one dimensional, just shouldn't be just prices. They sh maybe they should also have some information about what the bank, what the bank looks like. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Okay, um, so prior to Lehman, they have done a discriminatory auction. So just to give you some, um, you know, a little bit of background, because I only have only five minutes. But so these are the main refinancing operations. Those were three months, three prolongs. Okay, so basically you ask, you, they, were, they said we're going to give a billion, billion euros away. You put up a collateral and you get the loan, uh, well, for one week actually the MROs, these were the LTROs for three months. Okay? So for one week. After a week you repaid on a Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon another auction was run. Okay? The reason why I go into this detail is because there is also this, there is also this window that you can use. You can go and borrow at a rate, which is something like what the ECB is targeting, plus uh, a little bit of a, a, sur in a surcharge. Or you can go and deposit if you have a surplus at a target rate minus a, minus a discount. And the idea is that within that window, therefore, you have an incentive to trade with other banks and sort of you should be getting close to the target. Okay. Okay. Why do I go through that? Well, because you think about the bank. So again, in theory, we write down a V. Right? We write down a V, that's our primitive for the mechanism. In practice, this V doesn't come from the space. I mean, the V is pinned down by something. And this is a great example where sort of you know what the V is pinned down by. Uh, 
Why? Well, because, okay, if you, I need a loan for the next week, if I'm willing to pay for a loan of liquidity for the next week, if I don't get it, I have to get it somewhere else. Okay? How do I get it somewhere else? Well, I go to another bank. Okay? And another bank, how much can I borrow at? Well, if I have German treasury bills, I can borrow at secured rate. If I have some <coughs> Greek mortgage-backed securities, I probably have to pay a little bit more if they are going to borrow, if they are going to lend me against that. Um, once I run out of collateral, I have to get an unsecured loan. So this sort of an idea gives rise to some sort of a valuation function of this sort, where this is going to be somewhere around the secured rate. This step is going to be somewhere around the bank-specific unsecured rate, which includes, of course, some some uh, default risk and so on. And in the, mean in the middle, there's going to be some increasing sort of cost of borrowing uh, component. Okay? And the shape of this is going to be pinned down by the balance sheet of the bank. And so now what we talked about before, suppose we now have data from these auctions, which means that in every auction, for every bank, I can recover this. So therefore, you can look at dynamics of this, and you can start thinking about the dynamics of these balance sheets, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, uh, and you can sort of, so what we did in, in one paper is we, we, we looked at how, how the crisis impacted the banks, and sort of how the banks were heterogeneously impacted. And that goes back to this issue, of course, so who were, <laughs> who were the guys who were bidding the most in these discriminatory auctions? Well, the, those were the guys for whom the willingness to pay went up the most and by quite a bit. And of course, the willingness to pay went up because nobody wanted to lend to them, uh, which is because they were close to failing. So now you're giving money to somebody who is about to fail. Uh, but then on top of that, you would wanna, maybe you would want to do that if it was a liquidity issue, not a solvency issue. So there is a, something missing in that mechanism which would allow the bank to infer who is solvent and who is liquid. Okay, um, one comment before I wrap up, efficiency of the discriminatory auction. So this looks wiggly, but this is all on, the losses are all within half a percentage point, okay? So the losses are kind of tiny. What this is basically saying is that efficiency of these auctions is typically reasonably high, but forget this. This is the more important graph. So what this graph is doing is taking sort of the achieved surplus and comparing it to a surplus from a random allocation. So before the crisis, everybody was the same. Everybody was submitting the same bits. I mean, nobody, everybody knew that I can go to a friend and sort of get the liquidity loan there. Okay? So therefore, the auction itself was very close to random allocation. The realized surplus of the auction and the random allocations were very close to equal. After the crisis, so this is kind of second week of August 2007. Um, after the crisis, the auction became much more important. Okay? So in terms of realized surplus. Now, this is again, you know, order of half a percent, a percent, um, uh, but now relative to the random allocation. So this is coming from banks becoming more heterogeneous, of course, and so on and so forth. So what I want to finish by is this story about Lehman. So why they, get why they got rid of the auction um, altogether. So the blue curves are aggregate bit curves before Lehman crisis. And the three reds are the three last auctions in October. Okay, so what do you want to take away from there? By the way, there is a limit that, uh, somewhere here. So you know, the, the zero is the rate at, that the ECB is targeting. Therefore, zero plus a little bit is what you can borrow at from that window. So what you can immediately see is that there's a lot of guys who go to this auction and are offering to pay, it's a discriminatory auction on top of that, and are offering to pay much more than they can get the same loan at from the discount window. Having said, it's the exact same collateral. The collateral sits in the same, in the same place. So either they're, they're uh, stupid, or uh, there's a reason. There's some stigma issue or something like that. But the bottom line is that the auction, in couple auctions, actually cleared at a rate that was higher than the discount window posted price. Okay, so then the auction kind of loses <laughs> any point, and so they got rid of it. And so since then, they have the fixed price. Um, and they are thinking quite hard about how to, how to get back. Basically, for a re they, they got rid of the auction because of the stability issue. So they got really worried that, okay, if people are paying these huge amounts, they're just going to go under. And if a bunch of them go under, it's going to create all kinds of cascades. All right, so the question, I'm sorry about one minute over, but sort of the question that I want to 
uh, that I would pose is how to design a mechanism that sort of combines the two, somehow combines message, uh, messages that allow some efficient allocation of liquidity and at the same time limit systemic risk or, uh, uh, or address that. And I'll leave it there. So happy to take questions. No question crystal clear? Very good.